Our main text today, if you're going to follow along, will be Hebrews 5. The end of Hebrews 5 will be Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 3. And it's a hard text, as in it, it is um, admonishing. It's an exhortation by the writer of Hebrews. So let me clarify before I start here. Or well, I am starting, but <laughs> but let me clarify. This isn't a pastor beating the sheep. <laughs> this is what I said when I was like, uh, I had to go back over it again last night right before bed. I was like, I don't want it to come across as uh, harsh. Yes, there is rebukes and things like that. We saw how Paul rebuked Peter when we were in Galatians. We've seen these things. But we're supposed to do this with love and gentleness as well. We know that. And I don't want the way that I feel, my belief or my opinion uh, to be the standard by which I would use God's word to be like, I want to sort of put you guys in place. So it's not directed towards anyone here. Uh, and it's not a general brush, like broad brush stroke either. But it does have to do with what's going on in the church today. It's been going on for a lot, for a long time. Of course, uh, one, I think one of the reasons uh, I felt compelled to go this way was that the Pope had declared earlier this week that the Catholic Church uh, still sees homosexuality and marriage between homosexuals as a sin. To which the president said, well, you know, uh, I'm a devout Catholic and I disagree with the Pope on abortion and gay marriage. And all that stuff that goes with gay marriage. Well, he's not a devout Catholic then because that's a core belief. <laughs> <laughs> right? We and we all know this as a society. Of course, though, this means there's gonna be something going on because the White House put out a statement saying well, we're gonna be trying to get in touch with the Catholic Church to try to, you know. So first it's Catholic Church and then it'll be the Christian Church uh, on these issues, right? And many people have grown accustomed to this. We already have the Methodist Church is splitting up. Uh, because part of the Methodist Church uh, is uh, they affirm homosexuality and gay marriage. They let pastors that are gay be pastors. So we have this, that going on. So the LGBTQ uh, thing, as a, and, then, and also self-help, right? Where a lot of the church seems to be more, like I said last week, humanistic theology. You are the center. So it's about you, 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 right? And there's nothing wrong with teaching the truths that are in the Bible positionally, that you're justified, you're perfect, you're great, right? You're good. Uh, as far as God is concerned, you are perfect. You're a saint, right? But I don't want to do that to the point to where I build you up and build you up and build you up to where it's just, it's me, 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 yes, right? <laughs> All right, so on that note, then we go to the, okay, so one, one of those fasting growing genres then, right, of books would be the self-help books, right? There's books that promise solutions to our problems, to all the life problems. Many are secular. They use principles drawn from modern psychology and philosophy, New Age mysticism, medicine, and other sources, Right? Uh, a notable minority of these are uh, Christian, Christian focus. Remember the chicken soul or chicken soup for the soul series? That was so popular, right? That was good. But we have all these books that promise to help Christians live the good life. All right. So what's at stake? I think there is the sufficiency of God's word. Okay. So to walk closer to Jesus, to live out our faith, to get closer to God is the, the, the issue. And just as the world is hooked on the self-help bestsellers, many believers are as well, both by the Christian books as well as secular books, right? And if it's not, you know, and I'm not knocking it all, all right? I'm not, but 
we have to ask, why, why are these self-help books, why are these things so popular in the church? Why don't we consider God's power to change us through his word instead, right? We don't know how to read it. A lot of us don't know about it or know, know how to get this. But last week I stated how theology and doctrine is vital. It's important, right? It's vital to know and understand because the church has many issues. Some of those issues then are, uh, have or, or, or are false doctrines. Those false doctrines are a direct result of trying to be more in line uh, with what's going on in the world. Because you always want to try to be relevant, right? So we have to go this way, all right? The, the SBC is really focused on critical race theory and racism and what to do. I get email, I get three emails a week about what are you doing about racism? Like, Nothing. <laughs> there shouldn't be. I'm sure there are Christians that are racist, but I'm sure. But the, my, I believe the, 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 the percentage o overall for all the United States has to be a minority of racism that goes on, all right? It's not like the media is trying to tell us, and now this week, now it's Asian hate. <sighs> Never heard of it being a problem before. They're, they're directing this narrative, but they, they want us to, to go this route. L SBC is very woke, okay? <laughs> they're very woke, uh, Critical race theory, very important. We ought to be teaching and preaching critical race theory. And so now they are imposing all these things onto God's word and projecting it to all those in the church and they're grabbing onto it because that's the relevant thing because most of us are white and if you're white, you're automatically racist. All right? I'm probably going to get flagged now. <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. Okay, so... <laughs> No, it still records. <laughs> the church, then, when you look at the evangelical church, like J.D. Greer, <laughs> he's the main guy over SBC, right? And there's another guy. They're out there. And then the Joel Olsteins and the, the, the Beth Moore, all this stuff, okay? The, the, it's come to resemble the world, a big part of it has become weak. It is stunted in its maturity. All right, the Christian divorce rate is is the same rate as unbelievers, sometimes higher. Believers declare bankruptcy as the, as the same at the same rate as the uh, as the unbelievers. Roughly ten to fifteen percent of Christian teens uh, have admitted uh, to premarital sex. 15 to 20 percent drink alcohol underage and consume drugs. 25 to 30 percent have reported physical or sexual abuse by parents or from people in the church. So, is it any surprise that Christians share in life's failures? <laughs> right? We set, share in life's failures at virtually the same rate as the world. Right? When we so often seek help from the same sources as the world. Christians today commonly, uh, we read the same, the same books, watch the same TV shows, the same fads we follow, the same music. I know, I'm just, don't feel bad if you do these things. I'm just saying, this is what we do, though. All right, we invest their time, our time studying powerless teachings. As a result, we end up just as spiritually mal malnourished as the unbelieving world around us is. We've largely set aside what it is that makes us different, right? Which is the word of God, the very source of the power, Jesus himself, which is made alive through the word. And there's going to be people that say, well, oh, you're one of those Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Because <laughs> they, they do that in, chur in, in church too. No, Holy Spirit <laughs> speaks through us, to us through his word, though. Not this guy's new teaching that's been kept secret for 2,000 years, okay? So we, we set aside the sufficiency of the word of God. That's my point. In the first century, then the writer to the Hebrews was contending with the same, like a similar problem. 
They were trying to go, they were like, ah, we're going to go back to the law. All right. So we've learned a lot about that from Galatians, right? And the law and it doesn't. Okay. So near the end of chapter five in Hebrews, right? The, the author is about to explain this very complicated issue. And it is complicated. It concerning this priest, Melchizedek. All right. He's a high priest from Genesis chapter 14. Much debate over Melchizedek, all right? But the author has to pause. Now, remember, it even gives you more insight when the author is inspired. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not just the writer then that pauses. The Holy Spirit says, we have to pause beforehand to admonish the church with these words. Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 3. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Discernment. Therefore, let us have the elementary doctrine of Christ and go, or let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And of, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. And this we will do if God permits. The writer under a hins- inspiration of the Holy Spirit is forced to pause. <laughs> His discussion going into Melchizedek because he knows how immature and unprotected prepared this church is for this topic and this church's immaturity extended well beyond merely a poor understanding of Melchizedek he said they had become dull of hearing it means lazy (laughs) dull of hearing means lazy so this church cannot appreciate a difficult teaching Because the church is not accustomed to the difficult work of hearing. (laughs) Or of studying God's word. Do we understand that? When you put that, difficult of hearing means they're lazy. They are not accustomed to actually just hearing God's word. (laughs) They cannot accomplish this easy task of hearing a difficult or what they would think difficult teaching is. So notice this isn't a a matter of ability or training. It's not spiritual gifting or a role in the church. It's a matter of effort and a matter of diligence. It's committing to maturing. All right. If they had been attending to their duties, the writer says that this church should, should by now have gained Uh, the capability through study of teaching uh, uh, through study uh, of being able to teach others about difficult things like Melchizedek. But it says they are far from that ability. So he's, he's jumping their case about it. He's scolding them, right? He's (laughs) now understand he, he wasn't suggesting they, that, Hey, you guys don't have a spiritual or you should have a spiritual gifting of teaching, or you guys should have the role of teaching. He's merely pointing out that they should have applied themselves enough to the extent that they had obtained enough knowledge and understanding that if called upon or being used as an instrument by God, they could teach somebody else. And that's the the point there. Someone, we learned last week how someone is saved, right? So when that new creation then has been made new, that person is now new. They're born from above, all right? They need to have people around them to say, okay, 
what just happened is what we call soteriology. Here's how it works, right? And this happened because of Christ and all that, right? And when we start to study Christ, that's Christology. And I understand you're all not going to know all the big words. But you have to have a simple, basic understanding to grasp the things that you believe in order to teach them these things. So they can be at the head of the line with the rest of everybody. Unfortunately, what I'm addressing is that most people aren't at the head of the line. <laughs> There's not even a line. <laughs> okay? So, they couldn't. They could not teach someone else. This church needs uh, remedial education. They seem to have forgotten what little they may have learned in the past. And the author says that they need again to be taught the elementary principles from the oracles of God. And that means they need to be taught doctrine. They need to know the word of God. That like an infant, they have to return to living on milk rather than continue to try to eat solid food. Okay, so that illustration would be if you have a baby, we know you cannot give a baby solid food, right? You would kill the baby. The baby would choke or its digestive tract would not be able to process the food and they would starve. It has to have something easy to digest, something that's nourishing though. It's simple, but it's nourishing. So milk's the perfect food for a baby. At some point, the child's body reaches its limit on milk. It cannot grow further without more complex foods. That The food that sustained it in that that stages of being an infant cannot continue to fuel their growth for maturity. They need solid food. If you do not give a child solid food, right, and you continue to, to be fed milk, the body then grows anemic. What, what was once the perfect food now becomes completely useless for the growth and maturing of that body. Taken long enough, the milk becomes the death of the child then. Growth will cease, strength will fade, sight grows dim, life over. The author's concern is the same here for this Hebrew church. They received the essential teachings of the church. They received their milk. But when the time for maturing came, they never progressed to solid food. They remain stunted then. They continue to feed on these elementary teachings. And now they've, they've now even left those aside, which is why the writer says they have to now again uh, repeat those teachings and relearn them. So by perpetually subsisting on milk, they have stunted their growth. And their very existence as a church is in question by the author here. So what are these things? What are those elementary principles? Because we should be able to, if we can identify those, that is something that we should be able to go, okay, these are things we need to learn then, right? If we don't know them already. So these elementary principles are the milk then that every Christian, every Christian they need from their earliest days in the faith. So when somebody gets saved, like I just said, these are the things that they should be in, uh, instructed and educated in. They're listed. Right there in 6, 1 and 2. There's repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And of, of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the, of the dead, and eternal judgment. Alright, so first the need to repent from dead works and show faith toward God. That's the gospel message. <laughs> we should be able to tell what the gospel is as a new Christian enters the, into their faith. It's important to teach them how that change occurred. Of how the Holy Spirit changed them and what grace by faith means. What justification is. Of how works fits into the life of a Christian. But it's a response to salvation rather than the means of salvation. Yet so often Christians attend the regular service every Sunday, hoping, because there are, there are some hoping, we mentioned this, hoping to be edified in the meat of the word, only to discover that the main message in the sermon is another exhortation to repent 
and believe in the gospel. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever have noticed, been here two years, right? It's been two years <laughs> since I've been here. Almost three in August. Almost three. Yeah. I've never given an altar call. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed that. <laughs> now, I could give an altar call for those who need prayer to come and get, receive prayer, but I don't need to give an altar call for you guys to repent to receive Christ. That's why I don't do it, because you guys are already in Christ. Yet there are pastors who week after week after week always put that out. I have to do it, right? They may have more people coming in and out. I understand some of that. But sometimes it's the same type of message just redone to get someone to, or to hope to repent, to believe in the gospel. And there's other people there that are like, eh, like, I'm anemic. <laughs> I need some doctrine. Others go to church week after week to hear some wishy washy type of story, three points in a poem or some relevant thing, and then just have one verse tacked on in there. And, and they, they receive nothing. They may feel good for the moment, but they receive nothing really. So where is the challenge to press on then to maturity into the church, right? Where is it? Secondly, there's the teachings on washings and laying on of hands, baptism and anointings and giftings. This is what I was telling Olivia this yesterday. This is what, he says baptisms, the giftings of the works of the Holy Spirit. It's the works of the Holy Spirit. The writer says these teachings are milk. Something even the newest Christian should be taught and, under, and understand. And find that first again. You know, yeah, the laying on hands <clears throat> is baptism. These are anointings and giftings that go in with those words, okay? Washings, laying on of hands. These are the gifts and works of the Holy Spirit. He's saying they are milk. I took a nine-month class on that. <laughs> but I thought I was going deeper, too, though. You know what I mean? That's what I mean was like over in certain groups in, in the church, the focus is... Gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You, we got to learn. We have to teach. We got to have a class. That's what we did. A nine month class on this stuff. So, and just just as with the gospel message that was once taught, the Christian should be prepared to put those teachings aside and move on. Yet we have to ask: Then, how many of us remain utterly confused even to this day on what the Bible says on? the spiritual giftings, on the purpose and the meaning, meaning of baptism and on the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and the body of Christ. Then he has the resurrection of the dead, which is an understanding of our, uh, e our eternity to be in. Uh, it's gonna, all these are debated, have different size. But I make sure I put here to be resurrected at death at the uh, uh, when you die or at the end of the world, whenever. <laughs> at, and then to reign with Christ. Here again, elementary teaching for all Christians. And then eternal judgment. Eternal judgment then, that's for unbelievers. That's the teaching from Scripture that all unbelievers will be judged, suffer the penalty for their sin in eternal death. Now, most Christians understand that and they know that and that's what they usually preach on the most. <laughs> Fire and brimstone, right? <clears throat> so, these are elementary teachings. Something every Christian should learn in Christianity 101. Again, how many of us really understand these much less are, would be able to explain or teach these to a new Christian. M most are spiritual infants and requiring milk when they should have long ago progressed to solid foods. All right, And that food is the meat of the Word of God. It is our Bible. It, 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 it's sufficient. Another, another issue is not just the self-help books and all the, these type of things, is that somewhere along the way churches came up with a crazy idea that the only the only uh, that only the pastor <laughs> is the one who needs to understand the Bible. 
<laughs> you know, and it's like when people find out I'm, I'm a preacher and then they're like, you know, I'm not a preacher and stuff. So I, I just don't understand it the way probably you do. It's like you don't have to like, what is that? You don't don't do that. <laughs> right. I'm not really a pastor by choice either, really. I mean, I like it, but <laughs> I sought out to learn the Bible. I really did, you know. And then when I found out, there was all these, like, I, I've explained it so many times to you guys, but when I found out there was a thing called hermeneutics and a way to interpret the Bible, and I learned that, then I could read it, and then I understood it. And then it changed. It changed me. But there are people that just think the pastor is the one who should know it all. So go ask the preacher. <laughs> all right. But a disciplined, in-depth study of the word of God is the medicine, right? We should know that. If that is the case, then it can heal us of our confusion, our sickness, and our sin. So you, you consider 514 in Hebrews, that those who fail to mature beyond milk and who uh, therefore cannot stomach the solid food will never be able to discern good from evil. That's when you had that look on your face, Olivia, when I was reading that. That's so important. Such a church won't be able to discern good teaching from bad. Real words from false words. Prophet. Real prophecy or fake prophecy, if that's a thing. Such a church is likely to fall prey to those teaching and return to the law, as right here in the case with Hebrews. Such a church will succumb to false teachings on health and wealth, prayers of decrees and declarations, and other issues, as is in the case of our church today. Such a church will find men and women, women submitting to doctrines of works, trying the, uh, to bear the yoke of our spiritual fathers that they could not bear themselves. In such a church, a, a church that cannot discern from the good teaching uh, of Scripture, from the, from the evil teachings of, the, of man or of the world, will accept these as, accept as truth the falsehoods of these men and unbelievers. Teachings like evolution, the word faith movement, new age spirituality, in all of its many forms, like the Enneagram, <laughs> embracing marriage of same-sex couples and transgender and gender fluidity and all those things. And if our church cannot discern good from evil, then we have no hope of wit witnessing to the world by the difference in the lives of who we are. God's sovereignty over his church and over its members begins and ends with the sufficiency of his word. It's right there. We don't need to go elsewhere to find other things. It's good to listen to, like, I'm not putting, like, don't grab the commentary. Don't grab the study Bible. Don't, don't hear things I'm not saying. All right. <clears throat> That stuff's fine. But Scripture also teaches that if, if it is the Word itself is, is, is the way that God has chosen to change us, to mold us, to conform us to the likeness of Christ. In Hebrews 10, 12 and 14, it says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be, be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he was perfected, or he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I said earlier, you're perfect, you're saints. He has perfected for all those, or for all time, those who are being sanctified, though. That's the issue. Verse 14 tells us that Christ's one offering of himself on the cro cross perfected us forever. Our perfection before God is complete, yet we still must be sanctified and have a renewal of the mind to be made holy and set apart in perfection. So if you're like me, you're asking, wait, we're perfect, but we still have to be made better. 
<laughs> right? That's how I think people, like, how does that work, right? I've said positionally before. Positionally in the everyday daily life experience, all right? Positionally, we stand bef- perfect in position by virtue of Christ's work. We still experience imperfection, though, and sin within our lives on a day-to-day basis. And God wishes to remove the presence of sin in, every, in, in us every bit as much as he has already removed the penalty of sin upon us. And, and, and the means by which God does both, both works is through his word. It's like Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2, 2, he states that like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. The word of God will grow the believer in respect to salvation. Meaning in living out the perfection that he, that you will be able to live out the protection that he's already obtained through Jesus. So Christians suffer broken marriages. We know this. The stress of overcommitted lives, lack of direction or meaning in their lives. What's the purpose and all these things. And then they turn to Oprah or Dr. Phil. (laughs) Right? They do. Dr. Phil. Catch me outside. They turn to the church. We offer some six-week program that's backed by a best-selling book. Six months later, we look around wondering why nothing seems to have changed. What's the main point then? What's the point? The point is if the word of God is not enough to address hardships, weaknesses, failures, heartaches, and so on, then nothing else is going to work either. Have we run to this first instead of everything else that's out there, including whatever's best selling in the Christian market? And as the author in Hebrews taught, with a, a life without study and, st- like, and, uh, and time spent with the word, we have no hope of ever understanding the truth, much less choosing good over evil and overcoming all the plagues that accompany a life marked by wrong choices. Because it is God's sovereign choice to use his word to accomplish his work in this world. Right? It's his word that goes out, will not return void. His word through which he created all things and sustains all things. And it is by his word that he will make the church holy. So Psalm 138.2, we're almost done, son. 138.2, it says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. This is what God does. God has magnified his word above even his name. He makes an oath in the Old Testament, <laughs> right? Above his name. We swear on God. He can't. It's above his name, right? So is there any wonder why he, he doesn't or he won't give satisfaction to those who forsake his word and go seeking answers elsewhere? I'm not saying, don't, don't misinterpret what I just said. <laughs> that he's like, <laughs> but there's sovereignty there, okay? Many Christians are weak. Many are anemic. Many struggle to live. Some of those issues are far beyond what we can even touch upon today. I understand that. There's, there's anxiety, depression, there's mental issues and things like that. I, I get it. I'm just talking about the, 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 the fogs and lights and the, just the, the stage presence of putting on a show to make somebody feel good. The, the country club type of churches, right? It, it's but it, it see it's this way it's this way because somewhere along the line we pushed the word of God aside and made it something only that our pastor should know in depth and many of them have even failed in that responsibility <laughs> instead of exegeting their eyes and imposing their meaning onto the text 
Many have declared the Bible useless and out of step with our times. It's archaic. Some would rather turn to horoscopes for their relationship advice or their life advice, right? There was someone on, what was it on Twitter? We will never learn. It was only the Holy Spirit that we can learn from. Don't even trust the word of God I saw this week. Don't even trust the word of God. It's only the Holy Spirit we can learn from. And there's some... She's a deconstructionist, so she's crazy. But there are some people that I know that don't really put much weight into the Bible at all because they're relying on the Holy Spirit. How are you going to know that's the Holy Spirit? Because I've heard people say, God has told me to do this, and it clearly contradicts what his word says. So because we don't have the patience, all right? I say we, all of us because we don't have the patience to let God work us through our struggles over the years of a lifetime we'd rather read the latest paperback about like about the Bible <laughs> or about God than take the time and effort to read and study the depth of the Bible itself so this isn't an either or kind of thing here all right I'm not laying like am I okay have I delivered this okay? She's, well, she's my, she helps me here. It's not an either or, it's not a bat like here, now you have to do this, so now I'm giving you guys a Christianity 101 study book to go through. Not doing that, right? It's a, it's, it's a matter of using the proper tool for the job. Our job, right? Our job, we've been hired in God's kingdom. To know what and why we believe to help other new creations so they can be equipped as well. So we should know then that our tool then is the Bible. It is the word of God. It is sufficient. And we only need to spend time using that tool then to know that how it works. Spending time with our Lord in his care under his instruction through his word. Service is good. Fellowship is good and helpful. Prayer, very important. Home groups have their place. And, and as I said, the Christian bestseller list may at times offer encouragement from time to time. <laughs> but it's only the word of God that has true power to transform our lives. And it's the sovereignty of God through his word, all right? The sovereignty of God through his word means that, that only the word has the power to change who you are and what you do, how you think. And I think we would be in a much better position today if this were the case. Because many have just set themselves up to be attacked, and it's just going to take a one swing. All right? Times may get bad. Times may not get bad. I don't know. I've said always make room for some bad things. I don't think the end of the world's happening, but the church may get beat up pretty hard in the next four years in America. <laughs> and that's because enough don't know the sufficiency of words God. That's why many have to say, they change things. They change words now to have different meanings. They say that's not what God meant when he wrote that. All right? His word is sufficient. That's my point, really. Learn it. Read it.